Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And I think we are the uh, welcome to our Thursday after lunch IT webinar series. I think we're going to be the last uh, webinar of the week before our a little holiday we have coming up. And I know a lot of people are taking Fridays and Mondays off, and it seems like spring is in full gear here. So, uh, but today we're going to be uh, talking about identity centric security, the new uh, agency perimeter. And uh, been a very big topic. We've been in pandemic now for over a year. And I, I think that at ATAR for the last maybe eight years, we've been talking about identity management and the importance thereof. But I think that all kind of kicked it next level in with this pandemic that we've been, been all deal with, dealing with. So I'd like to welcome all the attendees. I hope everybody's getting their vaccine shots and uh, we're pulling out of this pandemic. Uh, we appreciate your time. I'd also like to thank Cheryl Dorch, Eric Scanlon, Sean Applegate, Josh Broadbent, and the rest of the Swish Data and Beyond Trust teams. Um, they've been great partners, both these companies have been great partners, very active in the community and uh, you know, been essential, essential in, on this topic. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome all of our panelists today. We can all get you uh, unmuted and uh, get your video on. There we go. Damn, we're getting it. We're getting everybody here. Um, Nicole, I'm not sure your video is not quite coming in yet. Um, we'll get okay. we'll get Nicole on hopefully here. Uh, but anyway, I'd like to uh, yeah. maybe we'll start start off with you, you, uh, you Nicole. Uh, well, actually, while while you're working on your video, we'll get back to you. But uh, maybe we'll start uh, off okay. when you can. It looks like you're. Are you in the virtual office? That's right. Hanging out in the virtual office today. How am I looking? Yeah, you're, you're looking pretty good. I'm not sure social distancing is going on in that virtual office. Yet, <laughs> so I may have to have another webinar about that and get you straight. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, great to have you here today, uh, Ken. And Ken is the chief federal ICAM architect in, in General Services Administration. And uh, next we have with us Nicole Ballard. And Nicole's got the video rolling now. Uh, looks like you're working out of your home office. I like that kind of, that's some pretty cool art there. Uh, but uh, we'll, okay. we'll ask you that in a second, but she's the manager of identity and access management over at Sandia National Laboratories. But that is definitely an interesting piece. I know it's not part of our webinar, but I like it. You got good taste. How are you doing today? Can you I'm doing me, fine, how are you? Good, fan fantastic, Yes. fantastic. And I think this is your first appearance at an ATARC event, so we'll hopefully uh, uh, make it count for you. Uh, next, we have with us Sean Applegate. Sean is the Chief Technology Officer at Swish Data Corporation. He is a frequent contributor to this program. It's like a program now. It's like a TV show almost. How are you doing it today, is, Tom? I see you're, you're working out of the home office today? I am, absolutely, down in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Down, down in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Excellent, excellent. And last but not certainly not least, we have with us Josh Broadbent, and Josh is Director of Public Sector Engineering, uh, Solutions Engineering at the OnTrust. And Josh, how are you doing? Is that, are you really at HQ right now? I'm just kind of wondering. Uh, no, no, that is our, um, that's our background from our Don's Creek office, but that is a virtual background for me. Great, fantastic, fantastic. Um, and where are you hailing from today? Um, so I actually live in Arkansas. Um, I'm about an hour west of Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, wow, wow. I've always wanted to go to Arkansas, barbecue. I'm a big barbecue guy. Now, I heard they have some really good spots down there. We do, we do. Good, good. Well, um, great. So maybe we'll start off with you, Nicole. Uh, you know, you're at Sandia National Laboratories, Nuclear Secrets and uh, all the things that you have to deal with. And then you're, you know, we haven't really heard your story about how, how you all have dealt with pandemic. You've got a big enterprise there. Um, really interested to see how, how, how you all are approaching this topic. Sure. So um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm glad to be here. We, um, I think we're, we're approaching the pandemic in the same way that uh, all of you are. We're kind of figuring out as we go and we're relying on adaptations and adaptability and just making tweaks as we move along. 
Um, we do have a, a large enterprise. We're mostly based out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, although we have a secondary campus in Livermore, California. And we have people working um, at different sites across the country. I think moving to a full telecommuting uh, posture has really been uh, the biggest change that we've experienced during the pandemic, as I'm sure many of you have. And um, from an from an identity standpoint or an identity and access management standpoint, it's really um, emphasized some of what we already knew, which is uh, it's important to have a short-term and a long-term strategy around your identity and access management, which we are partnering within our CIO organization and our CISO organization to put the right amount of focus that we need on ensuring that the, the strategy is taking into consideration our changing world. I think we'll continue to have uh, teleworking to a great extent, as I'm sure many of you are, and we have to ensure that doing the most secure thing is also doing the easiest thing for our users. Nicole, we might be losing you a little bit. The uh, internet might be a little problem. Um, Alyssa, maybe work with her on dialing in possibly. It's okay, Nicole, we'll get back to you. Uh, Ken, uh, that actually kind of looks like GSA there a little bit, but uh, we're, you know, we're, we're I, you've had the opportunity to look across lots of the different agencies, different customers internally. I'd love to hear your perspectives on this topic and and what's really changed over the last, um, you know, over the last year since pandemic that you've seen across government? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I'm actually in the office of government wide policy, and uh, we're guided by the principles of the president's management agenda, um, and the office of management and budget to make sure that uh, agencies and our public partners are ensuring fair, efficient, cost effective, and uh, management practices. So, within our office specifically, we focus on identity, credential, and access management. To your point specifically, yes, the pandemic definitely did impact uh, how data is accessed, uh, both from your workforce and uh, from a citizen's per perspective also. Um, yeah, the, the main piece of guidance that our office has is actually the Federal Identity Credential and Access Management Architecture or FICAM architecture. <clears throat> um, from that perspective, we didn't make any changes. OMB came out with a memo specific to helping agencies um, implement remote uh, access, remote workforce. And uh, I think from, you know, every, everyone on the panel today can kind of relate to is that, you know, identity is important, you know, when you need to access data. Um, you wanna make sure people have the right access no matter where they are. And I definitely uh, agree that that was a challenge coming into the pandemic. Um, you know, when we're looking at the FICAM architecture, um, I mean, some of the areas that we get a lot of questions around is definitely, you know, cloud access management with a lot of agencies moving to cloud, like how, how can they modernize their infrastructure around that? Um, uh, but then also, you know, how can they securely allow remote access? I mean, those are really the two big questions uh, that our office yeah. gets. Great. Uh Thank you for that, Ken, and we'll get back to some questions. And uh, next, we'll go with you, Mr. Applegate. You know, it's a very complicated environment. You've got your telecom, you've got legacy applications, um, lots of, it's a very complicated problem, right? It's, it's involved lots of different constituents. And uh, I know you've had the opportunity to kind of work across government. Uh, love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, certainly, Tom. Yeah, in our integrator capacity, Optima, we see is the challenge between not just the user getting access, but many other things getting accessed or being seamlessly authenticated with the same passwords or one-time use passwords. So think not just of the laptop and the user, but IoT devices or secure signing code, make sure your containers in your application distributing are trusted. Um, and also getting access to network devices. So things like routers and steelheads and firewalls and load balancers they're often authenticated with things like SSH and also SAML if you're in the GUI, but more, more often we're doing those things here programmatically. And so getting access to those things and integrated into an ICAM framework is a bit challenging because they're not all done exactly the same way. So making that easy for agencies 
and knowing how to do that quickly and efficiently is very important. Great, great, thank you for that. And, and Josh, I know you guys have a lot of federal customers, so you, you kind of see that, but I know you've got a window into what commercial customers, you know, what their challenges are. I'd love to hear, you know, your perspectives from all, all you know, wide variety of, uh, in, you know, customers that you, base that you have. Josh, oh, can you hear me? Josh, can you hear, can everybody else hear me? Maybe yes. It's, okay. Yeah. We lost Josh there for a little bit. Okay. Wonders of technology. We'll get him back. Uh, he can call in. Nicole, I'm going to go back to you. Hopefully we got it. Okay. Um, it is April Fool's. Like, you know, I don't know. Something's in the air. We, <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on. I know. If you could finish up your, your thoughts. I'd... Sure. I'm, I'm not certain which parts you were able to hear and what you want. Just until but, the very end. Um, yeah, just until okay. the very end, Nicole. Yeah, I think what I was saying at the very end is just um, something that we should do all along, but especially important now that we'll have an increased teleworking presence is to ensure that the secure and safe thing to do. Hey, Nicole, I can't hear you again. But I am back. Um, we, we, somebody made us a, 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 kind of a smart comment, Josh. They were like, uh, is that the virtual Josh? You know, it, you know, Josh is part of the picture. Can you hear us now? Yeah, yeah. no, I can, I can hear you now. Um, yeah, I actually- okay, We'll get back to you, Nicole, sorry. Um, I, think, I actually try to practice my mannequin stance just in case that <laughs> happens. The, the more still I am, the more people don't know. So you're good. Uh, but anyway, just to repeat the question, it's like you have great perspectives from across government and across the industry. And what, what have you seen over this last year and the challenges the customers have? Yeah. So certainly to echo some of the other challenges that have already come, come before and been talked about before, you know, the idea that, um, that we have to verify identities specifically around privileged assets, even when people are teleworking, when they're working remotely as, um, early on in, in the pandemic, as it set on and people began to telework, we had a, a lot of challenges that were brought to us from customers around how do we send entire workforces home? How do we spend entire IT workforces home and still be able to verify their identity so that they can do their job and do it well? Um, so those are all things that, that we continue to see and we continue to work for. Um, uh, as, a, as a vendor, we really look at that holistic access viewpoint from a remote perspective as well as a, a privileged asset perspective and joining those together, so. Great, great. And uh, Nicole, how are, we, how are we doing? If You got the dial in going? I think it's okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you, you're loud, loud and clear. Uh, the wonders of re telecommunication and redundancy, but uh, yeah, if you just want to finish up, whatever you want to say, that it'd be fine. Sure. I was just saying that, you know, in order to keep everybody secure and to do the right thing, we also have to make sure it's easy for our users. Um, yeah. we, we tend to forget, right, that in keeping things secure, they really are our first line of defense. Yeah, and I think that I, I remember Anil, were you there when Anil Carmel was there? Like, this is like eight, 10 years ago. Remember Anil and yeah, Travis? Yeah, he, he was at Los Alamos, actually. Oh, that's but right. I've he was kept at in Los touch Alamos. with Anil and Travis over the years. Great guy. Yeah. Yeah, so I was going to bring up BYD, but I think that was there. So, anyway, let's uh, move on from that. So, um, and I'll start off with you, Nicole. With the significant expansion of remote workforces this year, you know, what has changed? What has changed specifically that you've been doing differently over the, like the last year that in response to your user demand? Um, well, I think what we've been doing differently uh, from, from our perspective anyway, is we're really trying to simplify um, how they access their systems from a multi-factor authentication perspective. So, um, you know, like, like many others, we have different ways that you might do multi-factor authentication 
depending on which system you're accessing or which application you're accessing. And in, in the spirit of what I was just talking about and making it easy for our users, we're really trying to consolidate and simplify so that they can use the same mechanism for multiple accesses and they're not having to think through, use a decoder ring, so to speak. Right, right. Ken, what's, how are the conversations changed over the last year? I know you've got a mandate and you've got to meet this mandate, but you deal with a lot with the users at OGP. What, what, what is the demand side? Where's the points of emphasis that you've seen that have maybe changed over the last year? I mean, it's pretty close to what uh, Nicole said, right? <laughs> you got to think about your users' uh, experience. And, you know, uh, up until this point, or even to this point, I mean, all federal employees are required to have a PIV card. Um, but sometimes for that to work, that means you have to be on an agency network. With remote work, that may not always mean, uh, you know, your access type changes. So uh, within OMB Memo 1917, it talks about uh, setting up pilots to use alternative uh, or different authenticators, uh, whether that is uh, you're using single sign-on and you're federating access using something like a one-time pen or maybe a different type of a hardware token. And that really goes back to also within OMB Memo 1917 is conducting digital identity risk assessments. So you look at the risk impact from that access, you arrive at a specific assurance level, and then you can make your agency can make the determination on what type of authenticator best fits that use case. Great, great, that's good. Um, Sean, how about, how about you? Yeah, sure. I'd say some of the biggest differences we've seen is getting the user in both the device authenticated so their identity of both things is understood when it needed to be and making that consolidated so it's very easy for not just the user to get in, but for the ICAM team to operate this complex system very easily. So their headcount to operate it's reduced, their ability to report on it and observe the functioning of all your authentication identity systems is very transparent. So you know how many people are on the network or if people are having a lot of difficulties authenticating, how do you then proactively support them and reach out to them so they have a great employee experience as well? Yeah, we've got a chippy audience. Um, they're asking a lot of good questions and being snarky at the same time, which I love. Uh, Josh, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges? This is actually a question from somebody. It's kind of like what I was going, going to. What are some of the biggest challenges in ID management and their solutions are you seeing on the commercial side? Is MFA adoption widespread? And what are the top methods? SMS, app, token? Um, yeah, we're drilling so, into this. Yeah. So yeah, the uh, there is some MFA adoption uh, obvious, obviously increased as uh, telework has increased. Um, I'm seeing a shy away from SMS-based authentication based on some of the, the SIM card spoofing and, and other things that people are worried about. So we're worried... We're seeing more app-based and specifically, you know, hard token, physical token based, um, you know, and really just coming back to some of the things that Nicole said, um, you know, we are looking at uh, the ability to really have that policy-based access um, to determine workflows. So we can determine what location devices are coming in from and therefore what assets and workflows they have to come in through. Do they need MFA? Uh, do they need a workflow approval from someone else to access a specific asset? Um, so we're trying to simplify that user experience by taking that policy-driven decision and, and really making it uh, automated and the workflow automated so that we don't have people out there trying to decide where is this person coming from, what, what are they doing, what, what assets are they trying to, to um, access, and then trying to make a decision so that the user waits you know, six hours to get access as somebody manually grants them access to a particular asset. Um, again, seeing that MFA solution being able to use, uh, whether it's a, a virtual PIV card that, that can be passed through with the remote tools that we have, um, or whether that's using SAML access or those other MFA solutions and requiring that at multiple layers. Those are all things that we look at that should be policy and workflow driven rather than a manual decision uh, based process that people are going to have. Right. Fantastic. How about this? Why don't we, uh, we've got some uh, poll questions. Why don't we do that to kind of spark out some spark some conversation, and then, and then we'll open it up to every. I'll open it up, and we'll we'll sprinkle in some questions from the audience. Like I said, everybody seems pretty chippy today. They're ready to roll, so it's it's good stuff. Uh, 
if you could pull the first one, um, where do you currently stand in building your privilege access management strategy in your organization? Are you in the research phase? I'm identifying solutions for my privilege access management. It's an area of focus, but other projects are taking priority now, waiting for budget to purchase PAM cybersecurity tools, ready to implement PAM solutions at my agency. I'm going to hang out here for a little bit. Josh, what can you, you know, for those that are, that they know identity management, what is privilege access management? What do you, well, how, what would you consider that? So it's, it's funny that you asked that question because we were actually having a conversation with a colleague the other day talking about how some people have a very specific narrow definition for privilege access management. And in fact, we've seen additions to um, some of the ICAM and FICAM standards where they're specifically adding in definitions to privilege access management. Um, but I really look at that as the, the viewpoint of how are we controlling access to our privileged assets, whether that's data, applications, servers, resources, whatever those are, how do we control that privilege and mitigate that privilege to the point that people can't exceed uh, the privileges that they need in their environment? So when we talk about privilege access management, it's really about recognizing that every environment is going to have a level of privilege uh, described and attributed to their users uh, and that we need to mitigate and control that to be uh, the least amount of privilege possible. Great, great. Well, let's get the answer to that question. We'll go to a couple more here. Go ahead, Alyssa. Okay, we got a ready crowd here. I, actually, I think that the ready to implement PAM solutions at my agency is a little higher than I would have expected. Uh, Nicole, were you, anything surprise you on this? No, um, I think that from my opinion, we've been working on this for some time, at least yeah. where I worked. And so I am not surprised that people are looking or they're ready to go. Um, I wonder how much this has changed. I think over the last couple of years, at least for us, as we start moving applications into the into the cloud, what we have to protect from a privileged standpoint has changed, right? So we have to ensure that we're using cloud integrated PAM solutions and that we can also integrate those with the solutions that we already have for on-premises. Um, if we're using different mechanisms for a long period of time, I believe that introduces risk. And so it's important to settle on a solution that can be used both for on-premises and cloud PAM. Great, great. How about you, Sean? What did you think of it? Was that anything surprise you? Was it right on or? Yeah, I, I would say I thought it was a little higher than I expected, but I think when you look at the full scope of the enterprise, most people are doing that pretty well on-prem traditionally. And as they move to cloud, that's often an area they have to make changes to adjust for especially if you're looking at a tick 3 architecture with an over-the-top solution where you've got to integrate your identity and your authentication and it needs to be contextual to the cloud applications. And then you also have to think about API calls and microservices going back and forth on-prem into the cloud that are separate identities, if you will, but aren't necessarily users in Active Directory. They're using tokens and other credentials. That's where it gets a lot trickier typically. Right. Great, fantastic. So we'll, the follow-on question, if we can put the follow-up question on the list, I think that'll be kind of the next logical step. Um, how important is privilege access management solutions in regards to your identity-centric security strategy? So um, let's answer that pretty quick and we'll give it like another five seconds. We, we got a quick trigger crew. I, I would wait longer, but everybody's like, so, you know, this, this is a live crew tonight today. Uh, go ahead, Alyssa. What do we, what do we have? Okay. Well, I think we picked a good topic. Um, and then the last one, which I think was a, a pretty, pretty good question. Uh, Go ahead and put the last last poll question up. And I definitely want to add some discussion to this. Go ahead, Alyssa. Okay, what is the top cybersecurity initiative your agency is planning to tackle in the next 12 months? 
securing a remote workforce, risk-based vulnerability management, extended detection and response, data classification protection, automating risk security assessments. When I was take when I was in college, you know, I would I, we don't have the multiple choice. So anyway, okay. Questions are rolling in, so we're in, we're gonna get this poll wrapped up and and dive right in. Go ahead, go ahead, Alyssa. Let's show what we got. I don't know. We just had a pandemic for the last year, so to me that wasn't too surprising. Um, any, any any comments on that? Josh, anything? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I'm not surprised by that at all. Uh, you know, my team has been focused on securing the remote workforce specifically in this pandemic for the past, um, you know, 12, 13 months now. Um, and we've worked with a variety of uh, public sector agencies, both state, local, and, and federal government. Um, and obviously we've seen an extremely high demand for that exact thing. Um, so there's nothing really surprising about that poll for me. Great. Um, I got one. I'm going to start off with you, Ken, on this one, because this is your OGP hat on. Uh, where does uh, PAM and IAM fit into CDM? It, it just let's open it up to any other government policies, right? Uh, any other mandates? Um, you know, how do we harmonize all the all the different, you know, executive orders and everything that's going on? How, how do you guys deal with that, just generally speaking? But I'd love yeah, to that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I'll add I'll add the, to what Josh said earlier and your question about, you know, how how do you define privileged users? And it is a little confusing at times. You know, are you talking about uh, network access? Are you talking about application access? Um, so it is a little confusing. Um, the FICAM architecture is actually like a government-wide collaboration and was updated recently. And we and it, uh, privileged access management was actually added as its own key component in your overall enterprise uh, access management service. Uh, so within the FICAM architecture, it's just, it's plain language defined as protecting accounts with elevated privileges that could, you know, you can include Windows domain admins, Linux super users, uh, or cloud-based like global administrators. Um, <clears throat> and if you're interested in seeing the latest update, you can just go to playbooks.idmanagement.gov. So to your question specifically, like what, what is our kind of method you know, to make sure that uh, we're not creating disjointed policies pretty much? Is that, is that right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we work closely with the, uh, uh, the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and uh, to make sure that we're interpreting their intent properly. So for example, with DHS's Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program, uh, the FICAM architecture is more of a reference architecture where CDM is more of a solution architecture. CDM picks products, they have an approved product list. Um, <clears throat> they may pick specific uh, implementation architectures based on the reference architecture of the FICAM architecture. So, uh, I mean, the CDM Identity Access Management Program, right, it includes four key areas of priv, trust, cred, and behave. And actually each one of those lines up to a specific area within the FICAM architecture, whether that's identity management, kind of life cycle management, access management, or credential management. So we do our best to work across government to make sure that our policies are in unison and we're not overlapping and overstepping and making sure that governments can implement uh, actual solutions and meet the goals of the government. Yeah, it's a tough job, believe me. I, I've worked in like standards committee and you have the same thing. You've got all these different standards coming out and they all got to harmonize. So um, yeah, it's, it's a tough challenge. And Sean, you're, you're like more of an operator. You guys are trying to, you know, take all these government policies and, and what's overlapping here. How, how, do you, how do you all handle that? Yeah, sure. We typically look for solutions where there's a lot of value, but we can aggregate the functionality. And to be honest, that's one of the reasons we love working with Beyond Trust, because they not only can do that for your advanced PIM and PAM and identity solutions at scale, but they do the unusual things around IoT identity or network access to over SSH that's still multi-factor and integrated. Or from a closed loop perspective, you say your user can't get on the network. How do I support them? So using things like BombGuard to do remote dirty internet support over a non-VPN connection is amazing because then you can get the user help when they need it 
so they can do their job. Great, great. And Nicole, you're a government user. Like you, you've got all these policies flying at you. You've got different things going on. How do you how do you how do you get all this stuff to work together and, and meet these mandates that come from time to time? Well, it can be challenging. I mean, even with a lot of the things that we've been talking about today, uh, you know, multi-factor authentication, well, we all know there are some some good ways to implement it and some not good ways to implement it. We have requirements that we must meet, right? We have certain levels, uh, AAL levels and IAL levels. And so we have to ensure that the solutions meet those requirements. Um, to a T or that we can put mitigating things in place to help uh, mitigate any gaps there. And I think we also have to, um, a lot of the requirements that come about, they come about very quickly. And so we always have to be able to adjust and uh, take a look at where we are today, where we need to be, and then work towards that. It, right. it often right. doesn't happen immediately. Yeah. Exactly. And we've gone, it's some new record here. Uh, I think we've gone just almost 30 minutes without talking about zero trust, but we're not going to go much <laughs> further. Uh, so somebody asked a good question. How are you approaching or aligning to zero trust with your identity and access management? And then maybe I'll start uh, with you, Josh. Yeah. So, you know, taking that concept of, of zero trust, and you know really working around it in making sure from a privileged access perspective that we're not actually um over privileging or, or even really just leaving privileges with people um we look at this from a, a few different perspectives and one of the ways that that we like to look at it is by actually having a process to remove um privileges away from the user and begin to do that policy based based on the application um, so now we don't have privileged users per se in our environment, but what we have is a group of users that have permissions based on policy to elevate particular applications. So when, if somebody wanted to use that user um, for something nefarious or they got in through a side door or whatever you want to call it, um, they, uh, they would actually have challenges because they couldn't launch anything other than what they were approved to launch to begin with. Um, so as we look at zero trust, we look at it you know, obviously entering the network and then elevating through the network um, and trying to remove trust at every point along the way through that through that um, threat life cycle, right? Through through the concept of of uh, each section of where a breach can occur, being able to remove the trust that is required to get to that section of the breach, um, whether that's you know the initial attack or whether that's investigation or proliferation, removing the uh, accounts and privileges that would be required along the way to to proliferate that attack um, really is a, a huge focus for us um, from a contextual point of view. I think you were, you know, simplifying things. I think, Nicole, you were talking about that. Do you want to add anything to this? Um, sure. I'll just say, like, there are trust, like with anything else, it has to be taken one piece at a time. Um, from an overall strategy perspective, it should be included there so that as you're doing tactical smaller projects, you can ensure that they are meeting up with that strategy of, of zero trust in the end. Uh, but I think it's definitely a one by it at a time situation with zero trust. Great. Ken, you want to add anything? I mean, I, I agree with, with Josh Nicole. I mean, really when you're planning your architecture, it's all about uh, priority. So what what do you have the greatest return on investment? What has the greatest impact um, you know, based on your own agency needs? Great, great. And Sean, I'll get you the last word on this topic <laughs> or unless it comes up on the next question. Yeah, so in our perspective, that contextual knowledge that Josh mentioned is absolutely critical in your, your system. And then the ability to identify if they're trying to access something, is it truly should it be accessed and let them in or is it not? In our case, one of the things we see in our, our SIM and our um, kind of role-based access control behavior base are things like users are not in the right location trying to authenticate or at the wrong time of the day. And your machine learning based authentication architecture says, hey, this doesn't look normal and it flags it. 
as part of the unusual policies and doesn't let them in. And we operate in a, in a you know, a, a GCC high environment for SWISH working towards our CMMC level three. And we see try, people try to authenticate from unusual places or at the same time from two different parts of the United States. And it's easy for us to flag that and then not let somebody in. Even if they got the password, they're not going to get in. Now we do multi-factor authentication as well, which is important, but you know, those are things just to be aware of that are out there that you want to take advantage of. Yeah, you got to have a little bit of AI there that, you know, you make a rule and, and, and something like that. That's an easy one to flag. Uh, we've got one and Josh, I, I, you know, I know you, this is like kind of like on your roadmap. I don't know what you want to share or not, but uh, how are PAM vendors like Beyond Trust planning to include risk-based authentication and just-in-time privileges capability in their product roadmap, kind of where Sean was going? I think you have some of that now, but if you, where are you guys headed in the next year? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so as we continue through our roadmap, um, you know, there are several places that we're looking at doing this. Um, we do have inerrant risk scores that we can, that we can deal with with a, a particular asset um, or a particular user from the, as uh, Sean alluded to, from the location that they're logging into, from uh, the time of day that they're logging in, those kind of things. Um, also with, you know, our endpoint privilege, one of the things that we're looking at doing is actually being able to check uh, against, you know, known vulnerabilities or a known list of, of applications that have, that have or require hot fixes. Um, and maybe while a particular application can normally be elevated, if there's a, a zero day incident or there's something else that's picked up, it won't allow that application to be elevated until the hot fix is applied. Um, so certainly from a risk-based perspective, not only are we looking at that from a privileged user, from an asset-based perspective, but actually even on the application level of applications that we're going to allow to run um, based on their vulnerability and risk scores. Great, great. Um, and, and Ken, maybe we can get with you after this because uh, I've gotten a lot of questions around this. Uh, my company is developing solutions in digital identity biometrics. What, what government resources documents can I point to them so they can all, you know, they want to comply. You know, it's it's especially when you're not working on a day to day uh, in the Beltway. Um, is there some? Do you guys have a site up or anything? Is there some some documents we can collect those and send them out after this webinar? Actually, yeah, yeah, definitely. Actually, uh, if you go to idmanagement.gov, um, there is a tab for sell uh, for vendors who are interested in selling products to the government, and it'll lay out instructions. It'll give you uh, there's some other links about how to work with GSA to uh, get your product listed. If it's a FIPS 201 product, uh, there's a special program called the uh, FIPS Evaluation Program. So it's specifically really for PACs and smart cards. <clears throat> um, uh, outside of that, feel free to send an email to our office. That's ICAM at GSA.gov. Um, <clears throat> I mean, one resource that is helpful in understanding how your product may compare to government standards is looking at NIST 863-3. So it, that breaks down identity assurance, authenticator assurance, and federation. So if your product falls within one of those areas, uh, that's usually the, the guiding standard uh, for di uh, government digital identity products. Yeah. And we've had them speak. So I think we also have a working group on identity management. I think it would be behoove us to kind of like be an area where we, we can take all these policies and put them all in one place. So uh, that's an action item for us, Alyssa. So we'll, we'll take care of that. In one um, housekeeping, somebody asked, Sean, are you referring to behavioral biometrics when flagging user access? No, I wasn't flagging biometrics. So more of no, the- it wasn't biometric, like, was it? Yeah, it was- Like okay. the, in, in my case, it, it is often the impossible travel, <laughs> something we see a lot of in a cloud-centered environment. Now, if you were if you were doing things like a, like a TIC 3.0 architecture, you, you could kind of hide some of that stuff and filter out in the TIC 3.0 architecture before it gets to your application in the cloud. And a lot of that's going to depend on whether that's your your application, whether it's an external SaaS provided application. Um, and so there's a lot of complexity there. But the bottom line is you want to have those analytics from all the different data points in your infrastructure, the cloud, the applications, the user. So you can analyze those in a single data lake um, and make decisions around those. And you want to be able to ideally modify some of those analytics over time to your unique use case. 
Great, fantastic. Uh, Ken, I'm gonna start off with you, but I definitely wanna hit Nicole and the rest. Uh, what pressure points or challenges have agencies faced when imp implementing FICAM architecture? What can agencies do to make the FICAM implementation easier? Yeah, uh, I mean, the main pain points or challenges with the FICAM architecture is, is the, the purpose of the architecture is it's a government-wide architecture. So the, the really to, you know, back to OGP's mission of ensuring cost-effective management practices, it's meant, it's not meant as a, a specific agency solution, it's meant as a, a government-wide reference architecture. So from that perspective, uh, the terms may not match up to what would you might be doing in your agency. Um, you know, some specific solutions like products may not map back. We try to make it as generic as possible so that you can work within the different identity credential and access management areas. Uh, there isn't a component example part to the architecture too, to see how uh, different components within an ICAM architecture may fit together. But that might be one of the challenges um, that I can think of. How to make it easier? How to make it easier would by all means reach out, reach out and let us know uh, what challenges you see. And I'd love to work together to make it easier. Uh, our office, uh, we, we work, I mean, that's the whole point of our office is collaborating and understanding, you know, what, what are the modern practices? What do we need to update and how can we share that back out? Great, great. Nicole, you want to add anything to that? Sure, I definitely agree with Ken. I think there is a lot of work happening right now to have standardized architectures and um, make those similar across government. The other thing that we need to, to get better at as we're working through this is not just standard architecture, but also standard processes. Because I think uh, oftentimes the implementers are left with the burden of figuring out the operational processes for uh, continuing to maintain and manage those architectures once they're in place. So I think as long as you get the technology side aligned with the process side of things, then it will definitely be easier for people to um, all march to the same, the, the beat of the same drum, so to speak. Fantastic. Uh, Sean? Yeah. And oh, go actually, ahead, yeah, sorry about that. No, just to, like one example uh, to add on to that is uh, the FICAM architecture, architecture and CDM. So while the FICAM architecture reference architecture, CDM is more of a solution-based architecture. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's where you can uh, work the two architectures together and figure out what solutions fit within the reference architecture of, of FICAM. Sorry, go ahead, Josh. Um, oh, so. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Josh. We'll get, we'll get to Sean. He's patient, man, anyway. It's okay. Um, you know, so just a couple of things, uh, and I'm probably going to take this one second to do a shameless plug here. While Ken's job is to make it as vendor generic as possible, one of the things that we have the opportunity to do is just to make this as vendor specific as possible, right? So we actually have an asset where we match our solutions, uh, both to the FICAM architecture service, to the ICAM capability, um, so that you can see exactly where we fit. But the way that you make this easy is also by using integrators that have experience of doing this, like Sean and the guys at Swish. Um, they've done it before. They're not trying to reinvent the wheel. They're trying to make it easy for you. Um, and just to kind of reference what Nicole said about you know, aligning processes, a lot of times one of the challenges we see when this happens is that people want to align the processes, but they kind of forget why they have the processes to begin with. Um, and so as we come in and as, as integrators like Swish come in and we try to implement these architectures or these capabilities, we'll run into these workflows and we have to stop and ask the question, why? Why does your workflow exist that way? And the truth is most of the time it exists that way because somewhere along the way there was a manual process that was required that we can now automate with a workflow or with policy or with intelligence. Um, so, so many challenges that we run up against are just the, we don't want to change this because this is the way we've always done it. And as you're looking at implementing these new architectures and these new solutions, you have to look at it like our world is changing. Our world is vastly different than it was on April Fool's Day, 2020. Um, and along with that, our processes and the way that we do things have to change. And so we need to look to integrators like Swish and vendors like Beyond Trust to be able to show us what should these processes look like. Oh yeah, absolutely, Josh. So let me let me run with that real quick, Tom. 
So at Swish, we're huge fans of continuous improvement, not just doing it with our customers, but consuming it internally as well so we can operate as quick as possible. And I'll tell you a quick story. So um, I, I bill on some customer projects. That means getting access to their environment and spinning things up and not only getting access to applications, but things like firewalls, network devices, or key creation. And one of our larger clients we supported, the process was, hey, show up to work and go through about six weeks of asking for access to things using Word documents and PDFs. And by week number six or maybe week number 10, you'll finally have access to everything to actually do your job. I mean, that's tens of thousands of dollars of wasted contractor cost in many cases. And when you have a lot of churn on contractors, it's a lot of waste, real tax dollar waste. When you can go in and use policies, so as soon as you get your AD account and you're added to the Active Directory groups, you have access to everything based on policies. And if you have to manually ask for something, it's actually a web form that is automated behind the scenes and it's answered in, in hours or minutes instead of weeks. All of a sudden you're saving real dollars, a real ROI at these government contractors. But then you can do things like respond to hurricanes quickly so you can onboard 2000 employees and have them functioning and productive in a day or two, not six weeks. So think about that from a business leader perspective, not just a, you know, I can, I own the architecture, but how do I enable the mission at, at themselves, that mission at the agency? Yeah, one thing Josh kind of hit me just in my career, it's like anytime you're doing some technology improvement, it's like, you know, when you first went to the cloud, right? It's like, you got to really review all your policies on what's really going over to the cloud or not. That's a good time to do some house cleaning because, you know, it, it's a lot of work to transform these processes that you're not even using anyway. You know, are people even using the system? Why even move it to the cloud? So excellent, excellent points, folks. Uh, the next question I have is uh, security best practice to consider IM and, 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 and PAM as two separate initiatives or keep them tightly integrated. How does that, how does that work? I'm not as close to it as, as the panel. Um, maybe start off with you, Ken. How, how, how are these uh, two concepts working together? We'll just start uh, yeah, with you. I mean, I mean, specific, specific uh, specifically, specifically for uh, privileged uh, access management, uh, there was a now a deprecated, it's old, an ICAM uh, privileged user instruction and implementation guide that kind of uh, had three steps in it, uh, identify individuals, that required elevated access, uh, conduct a risk assessment, and then implement a process, a framework, or a methodology to mitigate it. Um, I said, like I said, it is deprecated, but uh, we are looking at at updating it uh, because uh, privileged access management is such an important topic uh, today. Yeah. And uh, I mean, part of that is, uh, I mean, within that third step, you could even look at using existing government programs like CDM. Uh, for specific privilege access management guidance. Yep, yep. Nicole, you want to add anything? I saw you nodding your head there. Yeah, sure. I, I was just saying that, or I, I was thinking anyway, that um, with privilege access management, you, we have to, there's similarities to regular identity and access management in that we have to ensure the access they can get, what they're trying to access is protected. So, whether you're a regular identity that's trying to access something or whether you're a privileged um, user or, or now machines, as we see moving more into that space, we have to ensure you can access what you need to access. I think the implementation guides are helpful, but I think we, we see a lot of that changing. And I, I agree with what Ken said, uh, if we can do it from a high level government program that's going to flow down through all of the agencies, then that's going to make it easier to ensure we have consistency in the long run. Great, great. Sean, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll say just look out for the unusual corner cases. So if we look at somebody like an Eric Snowden, administrative access, had privileged access, consumed a lot of data, pulled it out. You need you know, layers of good policy, but you need curious security admins that have great anomaly detection engines. So when somebody does get through and it will happen, they're able to use technology to highlight, hey, something unusual is going on here. You should go look at it and then have the playbooks to respond extremely fast or ideally in a more automated fashion as well. Because it's just a matter of time and you really do have to be very uh, proactive about finding those folks. 
Yeah, I think we've seen that on so many, every security breach, you know, you've got a private downloading 150 pages of, you know, secure data. I mean, we've seen it numerous times and hopefully we can like learn the lessons it would be nice. Uh, Josh, you want to add anything? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so yeah, uh, just real quick, the, the concept uh, at least that I heard you talk about right at the beginning of that question was whether or not, you know, identity and access management and privilege access management have to be separate concepts and whether we're going to implement them separately. Uh, and as much as, you know, uh, I would love to continue the conversation of, of pushing privilege access management because it's a product that obviously my, my uh, company supports. Um, I, I think that when you begin to take the concept of privilege access management away from an overarching concept of verifying identity and who has access, um, then you're asking for additional risk that shouldn't be there. Um, if you're not appropriately verifying the identity of the machines or the people that are supposed to have that elevated access and have an automated way of you know, reviewing that privilege, of having an automated way of removing that privilege when they move departments or when they leave the company, if you don't have all of that, then you're putting things essentially back in the hands of the users and admins where it was initially. Um, and you're continuing the problem that all of this work was designed to solve. Yeah, let's let's stay on that, that subject. You know, I, I think AI as part of this is pretty important. Um, maybe Nicole, like if you could, you know, have certain aspects of the job automated or using some AI. Um, what what are your what are your thoughts on that? What have you guys implemented, or what what would you like to have implemented in a in a in a perfect world? Hopefully my question was semi-clear. Are you there, Nicole? I think we lost Nicole again. Oh, well, uh, we'll get back to her. Uh, Sean, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that. People have been asking a little bit about AI and you, you kind of were touching on it. And I think that's what actually sparked the question. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, the, the bottom line is to, to do AI effectively, you're still gonna need a consolidated set of telemetry or logs or some data to make decisions against. Yeah. So, you know, the easier and more tightly implemented your your FICAM architecture, the simpler it is to operate and get that centralized set of assets or transactions to monitor. And then you can apply your AI to that. And ideally that AI or that anomaly detection is in the ICAM solution directly. And it's easy to just buy it and use it. Um, if you have to bolt it on later, it's a lot more expensive, a lot more complex. I would say from a you don't have to do AI to do automation though. So the simple things that are available, writing simple playbooks with SOAR frameworks to say, hey, when I see this thing, go run this automation to collect data and help me make a okay. decision very rapidly. And those are things that your tier two, tier three SOC individuals can go build and you can give them to your tier one SOC analyst to use. And that's a great way to streamline your workforce. And so I would say, you know, training is a really important part of that, not just the technology, but the people and the processes and enabling the frontline workers to serve themselves and feel empowered to, to respond quickly. Great, great. Ken, does this come up in, 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 in any of the discussions, uh, uh, you know, automation, AI, that kind of thing? How do you build that in or, or, or not? Uh, it actually does. Um, <clears throat> but the, the majority of questions we get are, you know, we, we want to use robotic process automation and we, we have this specific use case, uh, but, um, we, we want to use it unsupervised. How could we do that? Um, and we actually, we wrote a playbook called the Digital Identity Worker Playbook. It's a risk assessment, so you can go through and see, you know, based on the level of network access, the level of data access, what's it, the bot doing? It's not just bots. Uh, it could be uh, AI, it could be uh, M or artificial intelligence, machine learning, it could be scripts. We try to keep it agnostic from that standpoint, but it's looking at what what is this uh, what is this <laughs> digital worker doing? Is it providing advice, and then it's giving you kind of a risk level of how you could uh, continue to use a, uh, a a digital worker in an unsupervised manner, but still uh, maintain the uh, risk the risk of it. Great, great. Uh, boy, this panel is moving by quick. Uh, Kind of more, we're closer to the end than the, than the beginning. Okay, it's April Fools. 
2022. Uh, we're going to do this panel again. I'll talk to Cheryl. We'll figure something out. But what is, what, what is where are the federal government? I'm going to have to start off with you, Ken, because you're the Office of Government Wide Policy, and you're going to do this great, fabulous job. Where are we going to be you know, in the government a year from now? What do you think is realistic? Yeah, I, I mean, a year from now, uh, it, it'd be interesting to see, yeah, like the, the major things that we're working on right now are uh, guidance around single sign-on, uh, cloud identities, and then helping agencies implement a digital identity risk management uh, uh, process. So it'd be great to see once those are implemented, what agencies can do with that capability now. I mean, that, that'd be interesting to see. Great, great. Nicole, do we have you back? I think so, yeah. Can oh, you hear me? Oh, we do. Me? Yes. Um, I agree with Ken. I, for one, it would be happy to see those, those implementation guidelines and, and be a part of that future. I think um, what we'll see is that we'll continue to see a lot of automation like we were just talking about so that we can get our people to concentrate on new initiatives and better ways to help our workforce meet the mission as opposed to just keeping the cranks turning. Um, but I do think that we are going to see uh, a lot more. We will continue to see people working offsite. I don't think we're going to go back to a normal state that we once had. And uh, I believe that we'll continue to figure out ways to secure those users and get them to be able to continue to do their jobs. Great, great. I think you're right. I think we're going to be, the new normal is going to be this hybrid situation much more than we've had in the past. Sean, how about you? Yeah, I'm going I'm I'm to make a bet and say in a year from now, we're going to be a lot more mobile, more cloud centric. You're going to see highly performant, high velocity organizations be light years ahead of laggers in the government. So those that are willing to take the chance and make take the risk and really stretch for automating their infrastructure, adopting cloud, deploying 5G for IoT infrastructure to be an innovative nation are gonna be drastically farther ahead a year from now. And you're gonna start seeing this larger velocity gap between innovative agencies and laggards that are very risk adverse and change adverse. And you're gonna need a team of partners that understand how to automate those functions, build RPA bots to streamline your digital workforce, to subsidize your people workforce, but you've really got to focus on your culture to get there. It's not just technology. I, I, think you, I, th I think you said that very well, Sean. I think we saw in pandemic, those that had started some initiatives right before pandemic, boy, they were ahead of the game. And, uh, you know, they were in a lot better shape. You know, those that were in the cloud early. And I think that innovation has gotten a little, people are seeing the rewards of it being there earlier. Maybe not first, but pretty early. Um, so I think that's great. Uh, Josh, my friend, you are getting the last word. Well, um, after the last 14 months, uh, I think that in a year, we're going to have a, uh, an island park with dinosaurs extracted from the DNA of mosquitoes that are encased <laughs> in amber. Like that's, I'm afraid to make predictions at this point because I have no idea what's coming. Um, but here's what I will say. Um, what we've learned over the past 12 months is that our idea of normal can change in a heartbeat. So what we're going to see both from our government and from commercial solutions is the idea that we have to be flexible and dynamic and ready to pivot and move in a direction that we need to go. Um, we might not see what that looks like right now, but in order to do that, we have to be prepared as uh, organizations, as government entities, um, to be able to manage these identities on the fly wherever they are. Uh, and be able to allow people to do their jobs no matter where they're working from. So many companies, so many organizations ground to a halt because their version of privileged users had no access outside of their building, which sounded great two years ago. Hey, look, we're going to lock this down. Nothing else is going to come. Um, if you want to do something, you have to be standing in the building with three managers over your shoulder, all putting in your PIV cards. And we've realized it just can't work anymore. There's no possible way for that to be a sustainable future. So we have to pivot. Great, great. Well, thank you, Sean, Ken, Josh, and Nicole. Uh, and I appreciate this audience, very engaged. 
Um, you made it count, which is good. And uh, everybody have a great weekend and we will see you next week. Speaking of next week, um, we've got an IoT security. Are we keeping pace with the threats? Uh, IoT has been around a long time, but it, it's becoming more and more as we get into the 5G and some of the, some of the new technology Sean was talking about getting to be uh, uh, very important and uh, securing IoT, everything from securing the IoT to managing it. Uh, but we've got a great lineup uh, next week. Should be fun. Uh, once again, have a great weekend and uh, we'll see you next week.